I'd like you please to turn to Psalm 119 and look with me at verse 126. Psalm 119, verse 126. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. I just mentioned that I haven't quite finished with this series on the offerings. There's one more to come at least, uh, but not today. I haven't had the um, opportunity of being able to prepare for that. So this is just a a one-off individual sermon that has no previous context and has no subsequent context, but I trust it will be of help to us and of value in the work of God. It is time for thee, Lord, to work for they have made void thy law. This is a well-known verse, I suspect. It's one that I believe I have often used in terms of prayer, and I'm sure that many a minister from the pulpit would have quoted this verse from time to time, as well as many believers in their own personal prayers. It is time for the Lord to work. Why is it time to work? Well, the answer to that question is obviously the second clause of the verse. For they have made void thy law. Now, I want to speak first of all then about the law that the men of the the, the nations and the people in the nations have made void. Thy law. Now, generally speaking, when you have an expression like that, it is of course referring essentially to the moral law of God so-called or otherwise known as the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are abiding commandments. They, in other words, are God's law for all generations. It's no coincidence that when the moral law, the Ten Commandments, were first given to Israel through Moses, that they were written on tablets of stone. And stone, of course, indicates something that lasts, that is meant to be permanent. It's also no coincidence that when Moses was up in the mount, and you remember the incident that um, the people of Israel were down below um, on the ground beneath the mount, and they were under Aaron's leadership they were they created uh, the golden calf and they were dancing and reveling and worshipping the golden calf as for Moses we don't know what's happened to him he's been up there for so long and there's this noise that's going on down below and there is Moses up in the holy company of God receiving the law of God and when Moses comes down from the mountain he sees what's going on and he breaks the stone tablets upon which are written the law of God, indicating by that action that the people have already broken the covenant that was established between God and his people and that they have treated with contempt any notion of the God of heaven giving them a law and establishing a covenant whereby they may live. And Moses breaks the tablets in a kind of holy indignation. Well, what happens as a result of that? God says, bring a second stone. And God wrote upon that second stone, what? A new law that would be more convenient and more acceptable to the people of Israel? No, exactly the same words. Now that is a most important principle to remember in our day because just like the people of Israel, so people in our day, and it's not new, it's been going on over the centuries, that people have tantamount to to breaking the tablets and saying that we don't want your law, we don't want your rule, we don't want your regulations, we want to live in our own way. We want to be like Israel. And while God is in his heaven, 
And while Christ is seated at the right hand of God, we want to be down at the bottom of the mountain playing and reveling and enjoying ourselves. And if that's sin, well, we don't mind that. We just want to, to do what we want to do. But God's law is abiding. It doesn't get changed because people want something different. And you need to understand this, that in these days in which more and more and more is being legislated for, that is in complete and utter defiance of the laws of God and the ways of God, that will never mean that one jot or tittle of the law of God is ever altered to accommodate men's fallen, corrupted, sinful natures and wills and wishes. It will never be like that. It's an abiding law. And it's a binding law because whether it's respected or whether it's ignored, it's binding. It's God's law for man in every generation, whether we respect it or whether we ignore it. And therefore, it's the law by which mankind is judged. We've got a kind of situation today where people have been rewriting moral standards and all kinds of different things. We, we know all about these things. I don't need to tell you about them. And they think that um, that's it. You know, we, we will introduce these laws and we will encourage people, we will drip feed people with the idea that uh, this is how it ought to be. And if you don't like it, well, you're going to be in trouble because of your different opinions. And they think they've got away with it. And they think that they have re-established a, a new law that people might live by. Well, there's an awful lot of people that are going to come in for a very terrible surprise at the end. Because they will be judged not by their law, but by God's law. It's a binding law, it's a law by which we are judged, and a law which, because all men have broken, shall be the means of their condemnation. And that's the fact of it. Thy law. You see, they have made void thy law. This is what the psalmist notices and complains of. They've defied it, and they've defied the God who gave the law. To make void means really to treat the law of God as if it carries no authority and has no effect upon mankind. People think of it as being oppressive and narrow and limiting. And therefore they have repealed it, so to speak, in their own hearts and overturned it in favour of a lawless life because men by nature are lovers of sin and they don't want the restraint of God upon their minds or hearts or lives. But this all brings consequences. It brings consequences, first of all, to the lawless unbeliever. What are those consequences? Well, they include these things. The consequences of making void God's law is the ruin of human dignity. Now, I, if I said that, in a, well, I am saying it in a public place. And if these things go out on the internet and somebody listens on this, they will say, what on earth is he talking about? The ruin of human dignity? Well, of course it is. What is human dignity? Human dignity consists in being godlike and following God's ways and God's laws. And the minute you depart from that, you lose your human dignity. You become less than what God requires you to be and intends you to be. We become nearer to the animal world than we are to the human race. It's the ruin of human dignity. You, you think about it, my friends. You think about the way that people live and the way that they think, the kind of values that they hold, the sort of conduct that they encourage in one another. Is that what God requires? Is that what God intends for us? Of course it isn't. And because of this as well, another consequence is a chaotic society. I'm sure that we've all noticed this, that new laws are introduced and people have no idea of the outcome of it all. Where's it all going to lead to? 
And already you see the, um, the, 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 the legal system struggling to make sense of laws that have been introduced and people don't quite know how to think about all of these things and you get tensions being formed and troubles being brought in and it's chaos. They, they introduce one law that is in direct contravention to the law of God and then they realise what they've done and they have to introduce something else and there's correction and correction and correction and it's all chaos in the end. Of course, it doesn't have to be laws on the statute books. It's just people's behaviour, people's views of life that ends up in chaos and confusion. So there's another consequence of making void the law of God. But there's another, of course, which is even more serious. We, we incur guilt by making a dreadful affront to a holy God. You know, people think that uh, God doesn't notice, God doesn't see, God doesn't care if there is a God, that this is an affront to him. He has given us his law because it's an expression of his own nature. And as we go about breaking God's law, making void God's law in this world, it's a great insult to him and a great affront to him. And because of this affront to his law, a fourth consequence, of course, is death and judgment by that very law that men have made void. The judgment day is going to come and it will never ever be annulled. So there are consequences to a lawless unbeliever. And there are consequences of all of this to an onlooking believer. And that's the position of this verse. The words expressed here, it is time for the Lord to work. These are the words of a concerned believer, the psalmist. And it should be, of course, the words of any believer in any age who looks out upon a world that has made void the law of God. What is a believer? A believer is someone who knows and loves God. And a believer is one who acknowledges God's right to put a law into this world and to insist upon its observance. We don't question or quarrel with God and his sovereign rights. Whose world is it? Who made it? Who does it belong to? We say our world. Well, it isn't really our world at all, is it? It's his world. He made it. He rules it. It's for him and for his praise and for his glory. And so his rule over that world is his by right. And we approve, if that's the right term, we rejoice in, that's probably a better term, in the commandments and the law that he has established. We see its beauty, we see its rightness, we see its perfection. And when we look out at an unbelieving world that has made void the law of God, as Christians we don't look at ourselves as being perfect and perfect law keepers we don't think of it in that way at all. But what we do do is to look at the law of God and we say, that's right and that's good. And that's how we ought to be. And that's how we want to be. We're thankful that through Christ we have been delivered from our own guilt and from the power of sin. And we know that we keep falling into sin much to our great dismay and shame. But we see the beauty and the rightness and the perfection of the law of God and therefore when we look out at the world in its sin we are affronted by the affront that the world causes to God. We have a kind of holy indignation like Moses did when he came down from the mount. We see God in all his glory and holiness and we see people in open defiance against him. Not as though these things go on behind locked doors but they're in public and these things are legislated for so often and people shamelessly defy the God of heaven. And we look out at all of this 
that goes on in the world today and the state of people's souls and the views that they hold. And we can well identify with verse 136 of this same psalm. Rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. You look at the people in the world that have no concern about the law of God nor about their own spiritual or eternal standing and you look at them and you look at their ignorance and you think about their final end and you consider their desperate need and if there's any compassion in our hearts toward the lost there should be rivers of waters that run down our eyes because they keep not thy law what will become of them in the end without a saviour now all of this brings the statement, the words at the beginning of the verse. It is time for the Lord to work, for they have made void thy law. Now you notice, if you're looking in the Pew Bible or an authorised version, that there are certain words here that are in italics. Now if you didn't realise this, let me explain this to you now that where you have words in italic print it indicates that those words are not in the original in the original Hebrew or the original Greek but they've been supplied by the translator in order to give a sense of the meaning of the text now if you omit the supplied words there in italics you have a verse that runs like this time for Lord to work time for Lord to work there's no thee there and rightly commentators point out that this could be it is time for me to work as well as it is time for thee to work now let's think about it along those lines for just a moment. When we consider the world in which we live and their regard or their, their disregard of the law of God, their trampling of the law of God underfoot, would we not say that it is time for me to work as, Christ, as a Christian person? To work, to labour for the Lord Verses 124 and 125, the psalmist refers to himself as being a servant. Deal with thy servant according unto thy mercy and teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant, give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. A servant, well a servant has a master. And a servant-master relationship means that the servant has a work to do and duties to perform on the behalf, at the behest of his master. Servants are not the unemployed with time on their hands. Servants then are given work to do and we regard ourselves like Paul did as servants of Almighty God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what kind of work does our master give us to do? It is time for me to work, we can say. Well, it's holy work, because it's appointed by the Lord. This is his work, not something that we engineer or imagine or conjure up. It's work appointed by the Lord himself. And it's specific work as well. The law of God is not just for others, it's for us. Now this is a false notion that has crept into the, the church over the years um, because of a, a wrong understanding of the New Testament. We're not under the law, we're under grace. Now we're not under the law in terms of salvation. We don't work our way into the favour of God. We don't do things in order to win God's favour and, and obtain God's salvation. No, we don't. And in that sense, of course, we're under grace. But grace does not exempt us from living by the law of God. Salvation does not bring us into the point where we can neglect 
the law of God. Rather, it brings us an additional obligation to fulfil the law of God. And why would a Christian not want to be very careful about the way he lives? Doesn't salvation bring us out of the grip of sin and out of the condemnation of sin? Doesn't salvation bring us, make us right with God and deliver us from that which otherwise would have taken us into hell? Why would we want to live in sin? Why would we want to live outside of the law of God? It's a complete contradiction of the whole notion of salvation. So this law is as binding upon a Christian as it is upon anybody else. No, we're not saved by observance of the law, but we could put it like this, we're saved in order that we can obey the law of God far better than ever we could without the salvation of God. That's how we should look at these things. So the work that the Lord has given to us, the master to his servants, is to obey personally the law of God for his sake, for his glory, and as examples to the world outside that has made void the law of God. We don't follow the world, we follow the law that God has given to us. And that specific work, of course, includes also the proclaiming of all the truth of God. How ready we need to be to always resort to the Bible to say, the world thinks this, but the Bible says that. The world's fashions change and its opinions can alter. But we need to be ready to point people to the unchanging word of God that is the rule for life. The work that the Master gives us as his servants is also a compassionate work. The Gospel is compassion for the lost that have made void the law of God. The world needs a saviour. The world needs to know the way of salvation. And who is to proclaim that truth but those who already have received that salvation? The world won't proclaim it. False religions won't proclaim it. But Christians who know the way of the salvation have this compassionate work to perform in bringing the gospel to those that are the lost. Compassionate work then, and it's vital work. Why do I say that? Because it's not our work, it's not our will, it's the Master's will that must be fulfilled. And it's vital work because it's his will that the gospel message should be proclaimed. It's hard and demanding work in a world that has made God's law void. People in their workplaces where they inevitably mix with those that have made void the law of God it never crosses their mind, does it? We all know that. We can think of neighbours. Sadly, we, some of us can think of people in our family. They've made void the law of God. It never enters into their mind that there is a God in heaven who has rules and regulations by his law by which we shall be held accountable and by which we shall be judged at the end. And it's hard and demanding to bring that law of God and to bring those ways of God to a world that has disregarded it completely and forgotten all about the claims and the demands of God. But it's a work that needs to be done. But isn't it also a hopeful work? A hopeful work? Why do I say that? Because who knows that the next time we speak a word, the next time that we stand fast against that unbelieving world that has made void the law of God, that God will not own those words that we say, will not own the testimony that we bring, will not answer the prayers that we bring, and bring yet another out of that world of unbelief and unto himself. We have to be hopeful. We have to have that optimism of faith, as I would call it, that God can at any time do great and wonderful things that will put our unbelief to great shame. But it's a necessary work, come what may. We don't simply obey and serve our master 
because he blesses the labours of our hands and does what we want him to do, we do it anyway, whatever the outcome might be, because it's right to do it and he commands us to do it. And we're thankful for the opportunity and the privilege of him calling us his servants. But it's urgent work. Time for Lord to work. It is time for me to work. We only have to look around and we say it is time. We only have to look ahead into those ages that may remain yet before the return of the Lord. It is time now to work. It is always time, even in days of spiritual blessing, there is more work to be done. Well, so much for our work, but in the words of the translation here, the version that we have, it is time for thee, Lord, to work. And that's, of course, most certainly true because, as well we know, human work alone will always prove fruitless. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now, because of the, the way that people often tend to think we swing to one extreme or the other. Some people think that it all depends upon our human efforts and that we can do the work and we can win the soul and we can build the church. Somebody years ago I was speaking to on the phone phoned me and said, I want to come and conduct a mission in your church and within two weeks I will fill your church. That's what he said. It's the claim that he made and that was the end of that. Well, can a man do that? No, a man can't do that. A man has responsibilities to be fulfilled and a man has work to do. I have planted, Apollos watered, but it's always God that gives the increase. It's not the one or the other. See, on the other hand, men say, well, I, I can do this, I will do this, I can perform miracles, so to speak. Others, of course, veer to the other extreme and say, well, if God's going to build his church, then God will build it, and it's got no part in my life. And that kind of thing pertains in certain quarters. But it's not one or the other, it's both. It's the servant of God doing what the master of the servant has commanded him to do, but always in hand with God's work. Not one or the other, but both. We read that passage in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1, where Paul speaks about being workers together with him. Not apart from him, not him working without me, not me working without him, but together. And that's the way it needs to be. So it is time for me to work, but it is also time for thee, Lord, to work. For God must do what only God can do. Who can convict somebody of their sin? Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever tried to sit somebody down and take them through the law of God and prove to them that they have broken the laws of God? Well, you could do that. But how often, by your words and by your efforts, have you ever seen a face that blushes and a heart that's broken and a conscience that is suddenly alive? Can we do that? Can we convince somebody that they have to stand before the judgment throne of God? Can we put it into their hearts and minds what it will be like? We can't do that. God can do that and only God can do that. And you think of times of revival. And I've said this before, but I'll mention it again. Do you know that you read sermons that were preached in times of revival? And you read about the effect that those sermons had. And hundreds, if not thousands of people, were standing there listening first thing in the morning, coming off their, 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 their night shift work down the mines and all the rest of it, covered in soot and coal dust, 
and rivers of water running down their eyes because they are suddenly convicted of their sin. Who did that? Was it John Wesley? Was it Daniel Rowland there in Wales? Was it, was it George Whitfield? Well, they were the spokesmen. They were doing the work. But I tell you this, it was God that did it. You read their sermons, and they're fine sermons, but they're no different from many sermons that are preached in any other generation. It's God who does this work of the conviction of sin and to make people come to that awful realisation of their personal guilt and their helplessness. Who brings someone to the new birth? Who creates repentance in the heart of another person? Who creates someone uh, uh, saving faith in another person? Can you do that? Can I do that? Can any person do that? No, we can't do that. It's God's work that does that. Who causes somebody to turn from a godless and sinful course of life without regard to God? Or we can help to reform somebody. We could get somebody off drugs or, or whatever it might be and persuade them that this is not the way to live. This, there must be a better way, but... Who turns somebody around with a view and regard to God? That God becomes the, the ruler of their lives. We can't do that. Only the law can do that. God must do what only God can do. It is time for the Lord to work. Because of the state of things. And people's condition. And their enmity against God. They have made void thy law. Now this is a strong prayer a heartfelt prayer for God to work. We think of work as being activity, and so work is. But you know, there's a sense in which prayer is a work, it's a labour. Now what about the prayer in this connection? What sort of prayer can we bring in this regard? It is time for the to work. What kinds of prayer can we bring to reinforce this plea on God's part? There's a number of things I can suggest to you. I'll only mention them briefly, but prayers of boldness can be linked to this. Prayers of boldness. You remember the occasion in Genesis, when Abraham has separated from Lot and Lot has gone to live in Sodom, the city. And the sin, the tremendous and heinous sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sin has come, as it were, into the nostrils of God and God is determined to bring judgment down upon Sodom. And of course Abraham is very well aware that Lot lives in Sodom. And the men or the angels that God has sent have come to Abraham and at the end of their time with Abraham we read in Genesis 18.22 the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. And judgment was shortly to come and Abraham knows it. But as they went towards Sodom, we read, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And he's thinking of Lot and his family. And do you remember the prayer that Abraham brought? Perhaps there are 50 righteous men in Sodom. Will you destroy the whole city and them? And then he brings the number down and down and down this boldness, this appeal to God for his mercy and kindness. Wilt thou destroy Sodom for the sake of ten? This persistent, bold prayer that Abraham nervously brought before the Lord and yet the Lord heard him. That's the kind of prayer that we should bring. Bold prayer before God. 
prayers of appeal as well as we have in the scriptures, for example, thinking about those that have made void thy law. Psalm 94, verse 3, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they go on in their wicked ways? How long will you permit this? Well, you think of this perhaps as being an imprecatory psalm where the psalmist may want to pray for judgment to come down, but in gospel times we would say, how long, Lord, will you permit them to go on like this? Will you not bring them to salvation, to repentance, to faith? Or Psalm 77 and verse 8, where the psalmist says, Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Lord, has thy mercy been exhausted? Is it, can it be true that thou wilt not have mercy upon this modern generation and bring some out of their sins and unto thyself? Prayers also that plead God's attributes. Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. We can plead that before the Lord. We look out at those who have made void thy law. Lord, thou art gracious. Show thy grace. Lord, thou art compassionate. Be compassionate. Lord, thou art slow to anger. Delay the judgment that souls may yet be won for thy kingdom. Lord, thou art of great mercy. The sin is great, but thy mercy is greater. Show the greatness of thy mercy. Isaiah 59 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Lord, make bare thine arm. Thine arm is mighty. Thou art able to convert the sinner. Thou art able to take away the stony heart and put in the heart of flesh. Thou art able. Stretch forth that arm. In our day we pray thee. Thy ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. Thou art the prayer hearing God. Lord, hear our prayers, we pray thee. Prayers that also plead God's promises. Love to think about this, Matthew 16, 18. The Lord Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Don't we live in a day when it seems to all intents and purposes that the gates of hell in many respects are prevailing against it. We know that cannot ultimately be the case, but we bring this back to the Lord. Thou hast said, I will build my church. Lord, build thy church. Build thy church here. Build thy church throughout our land. Fulfill the promise and the decree that thou hast made. Prayers also that acknowledge human inability and utter reliance upon God. Psalm 127, verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. Lord, we labour in such ways as we can, but thine own word says, we labour in vain, unless thou shalt build the house. We can't do this. Lord, come and work in us, and work through us, we pray. Prayers also that plead for the Lord's reviving work. Habakkuk 3 verse 2, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath remember mercy. The prayers that almost flow from a heart that sees a people who have made void the law of God, are there encapsulated in Scripture as men holy to God, standing in fear of God themselves, but knowing God to be the saving and gracious God that he is, plead with God on behalf of those that have made void his law. Is that in our hearts, people that we know, people that we love, people whose faces we see from day to day, 
They walk along our streets. We see them on the bus. We see the anonymous, vast crowds of people in our land. And all of them, in one way and another, have made void thy law and stand to endure the dreadful and terrible consequences of it. Their guilt is upon them. God's judgment will one day fall. Lord, they have made void thy law, but it is time for me to work, and it is time for thee to work. The day of grace is still with us. The day when we can work and the day when we can pray is still with us. But there will be a day when that open door of the grace of God is closed forever. And therefore there's an urgency about this, isn't there? It is time. It is time now for me to work. It is time now for thee to work. And we pray to God that we might have that grace in us, both to work and to pray, that God even yet will come and do great and mighty things, even among those who have made void his law. He can change everything, and we pray that he will.